she was on the brink of what she thought was her ticket to stardom, an audition for a James Bond movie. But little did she know, her life was about to take a dark and terrifying turn. After meeting with a man who had promised her a shot at fame and fortune, what happened to Christine on that fateful encounter? Who was this mysterious man and what were his intentions? Keep watching until the end as we unravel the perplexing case of Christine Johnson's disappearance and uncover the mystery that continues to baffle investigators and haunt those who knew her. The Disappearance On February 15, 2003, Christine Johnson, a 21-year-old college student, was enjoying herself immensely while shopping at a mall in Los Angeles. She carefully chose a short skirt, stockings, stilettos, and a stylish shirt with a collar. Regrettably, that day signaled the start of a very dark tale when Christine vanished from sight a few hours after leaving the mall. Fortunately, the things Christine purchased that day at the mall were vital in solving the mystery surrounding her disappearance. That shopping trip turned out to be more important than anyone could have imagined. But if you are new to this channel, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications for more captivating and suspense-filled crime stories. The story of Christine Johnson is about to get more intense. A Stranger's Audition Five days after Christine vanished on February 20, 2003, a woman called the police station. She came forward with facts she believed would be helpful to the investigation. After reading about Christine in an article a few weeks prior, in the same mall, she was approached by a man who she told the detectives about. He urged her to come in for an audition, claiming he was working on the next James Bond film. She remembered that he had demanded that she brought along a mini skirt, stiletto heels, nylons, and a white shirt. It just so happens that Christine had bought those same items on the day she disappeared. From that point on, the case only became worse and took an awful turn. Investigators started compiling similar stories from other female victims of the same serial killer who had been stalking Hollywood for more than 10 years. However, it would take the disappearance of Christine Johnson, a young woman, to start an inquiry and apprehend this predator, Hollywood dreams and nightmares. The story of Christine began in 2001. At the time, Christine was 20 years old and had recently moved to Southern California from the little Michigan town of Saugatuck. Her goal was to finish school and follow her dream of becoming a movie star. As her endeavors in the film industry proved difficult, she started thinking about going back home. However, she finally made the decision to keep going after her Hollywood dreams in Los Angeles. Christine persevered in her hard work and was able to obtain a position as a production assistant for a recently released movie. She took a job at a cell phone firm, but never gave up on her aspirations despite the industry's challenges. Now, let's go back in time to Saturday, February 15, 2003. Over the phone, Christine told her mother, Terry, that she was going to the mall that day. Her mother advised her to pamper herself with something such as a Valentine's gift. Christine left for the mall after they said their goodbyes, and that was the last call Terry ever had with her daughter. Terry, who usually speaks with her daughter every day, became worried on February 17th when Christine did not respond to her messages. For 48 hours, she called her cell phone several times, but nobody answered. Christine's parents were even more concerned because she hadn't shown up for work. They reported her missing to the police out of concern that something may have happened to her. It was getting late, so the police launched a search right away. After visiting Los Angeles, Christine's family didn't waste any time spreading the word about her missing. They put up posters at Christine's apartment door, and the police launched a tip line, releasing Christine's case facts with the media to aid in her recovery. This spurred a massive search effort. Troops searched vacant lots, hung flyers from phone poles, and organized people to support Christine. Investigators discovered Christine's purchases at the Westfield Century City Mall on February 15th after getting in touch with her credit card company. They also happened onto the security footage that verified her arrival at the mall that day around 1 p.m. Unfortunately, it provided no information concerning her next location. In an attempt to learn more about Christine's activities after returning from the mall, detectives focused on her roommate to tell them anything she knew about her friend. The roommate revealed that Christine had come home, shown off her new clothing collection, and then left for a significant film audition. The roommate was unable to recall the location of the audition providing the police with reassurance that the inquiry was headed in the right direction, albeit in the absence of a specific location. Investigators examined Christine's phone records, 
using this fresh information. They found out that on February 15th, just after 5 o'clock in the evening, she had called a line in the Hollywood Hills Laurel Canyon neighborhood. On the other hand, information regarding a woman that looked like Christine was provided by a witness. The woman, according to the witness, was driving a white Miata when she pulled over to ask for directions to a property up the hill. Christine was that woman, and it was the last anyone saw of her before she disappeared. Her parents wondered if there was someone Christine knew who might have been a threat. As they dug deeper into the events surrounding her abduction, they told the authorities that Christine had lately broken up with her boyfriend. To help in the search for their missing child, further inquiry into it was discovered that Christine had reported a domestic violence incident with her partner to the police. The path that the detectives were certain to take would lead them to an ex who exhibited aggressive tendencies. Christine's ex-boyfriend was called in by the police to be questioned. He admitted to the domestic abuse incident, but angrily denied any link to her abduction. He expressed remorse and claimed that the incident was a one-time occurrence, that he cherished her deeply, and that he would do anything to assist her. Additionally, he affirmed that he was out of town on the day she vanished on February 20th. Pieces of the Puzzle Five days after Christine's disappearance, the police received a call from Susan Murphy. Susan had come across an article and a photograph of the missing girl. Upon reading about her disappearance, Susan sensed a connection between a man she had met weeks earlier in the case. I immediately recognized him. You know, I was like, that's the guy, for sure. Upon contacting the Santa Monica Police Department, Susan was directed to speak with the lead detective. The newspaper article Susan had read disclosed that Christine had gone missing after heading to a movie audition. Susan proceeded to share her own experience with a man she'd met less than a month earlier hoping it might provide valuable information for locating Christine. The man in question had invited Susan to an audition, stipulating that she wear black stilettos, a high black miniskirt, and a white man's shirt. This revelation immediately caught Detective Virginia Obenchain's attention because those were the exact items that Christine had purchased on February 15th. Notably, these items had not been publicized, so Susan's coming forward with this proved to be a pivotal moment in the case. After Susan conveyed her belief that she had encountered the same individual, the police requested that she provide every detail she could recall about the man. With her assistance, they constructed a composite sketch, which was then broadcast on national television. The Santa Police Department is seeking the assistance of the public to identify and locate the individual. On February 24th, nine days after Christine's disappearance, her car was located in the valet lot of a hotel. Detectives immediately informed Christine's parents, and they began to fear the worst. However, the car contained only Christine's cell phone. The valet informed the police that a man had dropped off the vehicle on February 16th, which was the day after she went missing. This development deepened the concern that something had gone drastically wrong. Connecting the dots. February 27th marked 12 days since Christine's disappearance, and there was still no reported sighting of her. Nevertheless, her family remained resolute in their search efforts. They also organized two vigils in her honor, one held in Los Angeles and the other in her hometown of Michigan. In time, Christine's case was circulated on every medium, along with the sketch Susan Murphy had assisted in creating. As the case gained more publicity, more women began stepping forward with eerily similar stories, aspiring to aid in Christine's search. One of them was Elizabeth Bazzini, she recounted an incident from 12 years prior in 1991 where she had encountered a man who wanted to let her play a role in a James Bond movie. The man had attempted to drug her drink, but she was able to thwart his efforts. She had noticed there was some kind of white powder floating in her drink. She excused herself and took her concerns to the restaurant manager. Unfortunately, she could not stall the man, and he escaped before the police got there. Now she realized how similar that event was to Christine's situation and felt the need to speak up. Elizabeth was not the only one. Christine Klugian explained how a man named John had assaulted her over a decade ago. The man had deceived her into thinking he was a music executive. He lured her to a hotel room with the most malicious intentions. He attempted to kiss her, and when she resisted, he began to assault her. He forcefully threw her onto the bed and attempted to tear off her clothing. In the same moment, the man retrieved some ropes concealed behind the bed and tried to restrain her. It is a miracle that she was able to get out of that room, but when she did, she fled the hotel and went to the authorities. 
Eventually, this man named Victor Paleologus was arrested for his attempted rape of Christine Klugian. He chose to accept a plea deal and received a three-year probation sentence. Just like the incident with Elizabeth, Christine's encounter with Victor happened a long time ago. After all those years, the police are now engaged in an intense search for Christine Johnson. The breakthrough came when a parole officer recognized the sketch of the man they sought was Victor Paleologus, who happened to be one of her parolees. Subsequently, the police secured a search warrant for his residence. In Paleologus' computer files, they discovered images of women wearing the same type of outfit that Christine had purchased on the day she disappeared. This pattern became increasingly evident, and investigators were determined to obtain answers from Paleologus. They discovered that he was already in custody on unrelated charges, having attempted to steal a car. Detectives continued their questioning of Paleologus, who provided no information regarding Christine's disappearance. To further complicate things, Paleologus also provided an alibi for the day she went missing, recounting his presence at an IHOP restaurant where he claimed to have met a friend. Despite all, Paleologus remained a prime suspect in the case. Christine was last seen around 5.30 p.m. on February 15th, and Paleologus's visit to the IHOP restaurant occurred hours later. There is a significant gap in the time period, and as you know, a lot of events could have transpired during this period. Tragic discovery. Amid these investigations, everyone hoped that Christine might still be alive, held against her will somewhere. But 16 days after her disappearance, Christine was yet to be found. With the case in full swing, Susan Murphy was called upon to identify the man who had approached her in a lineup of people. Upon identification, the investigators believed they were drawing closer to locating Christine. With the arrest, there was optimism that Christine might be found alive. Her family was relieved to learn that Paleologus had not been charged with murder before. So maybe, just maybe, he had Christine somewhere alive and well. Unfortunately, Detective Obenchain received a call that would alter the course of the investigation. A group of hikers stumbled upon a body in a ravine near the Hollywood Hills. Upon police arrival, they identified the body as that of a young woman, Christine Johnson. After weeks of searching, the family's worst fears had been realized. Christine was found dead. The autopsy results later revealed that Christine's cause of death was strangulation, confirming that she had been murdered. No longer a missing person's case, the police shifted their focus towards apprehending her killer, seeking justice. However, the absence of forensic evidence such as fibers, hair, or eyewitnesses posed significant challenges to the case. What they did have, however, were multiple reports against Victor Paleologus, and it was enough to charge him with Christine's murder. In the absence of DNA evidence, the prosecutors had their work cut out for them to prove Paleologus's guilt. They would need to construct a detailed case against him. Years later, the trial finally commenced on July 13, 2006. Paleologus's history as a serial predator came to light through the accounts of his previous victims. These accounts from different women served as the foundation of the case, but would it be enough to bring him to justice? Kathy DeBono, one of Paleologus's past victims, testified about an encounter from 1999, four years prior to Christ's disappearance. She was approached at the same mall by a man who identified himself as Brian from Disney. He had lured her with the promise of a role in a new James Bond movie. Kathy's agent contacted the Disney office and this was when they discovered Victor's lies. Despite the absence of a crime at that point, Kathy felt a sense of responsibility to prevent him from harming others and chose to meet with him. She was careful enough to bring a friend who was a skilled stuntman for safety. Unfortunately, Victor did not show up. Kathy could not stop Paleologus at the time and keep him from harming other women, but she could finally take the stand and testify against him. Another piece of evidence, Heather Maher told the court about when Paleologus attempted to rape her in 1998. He was caught and pleaded guilty, but after serving three years and five months, he was let out on parole on January 20, 2003. This was less than a month before Christ went missing. Perhaps the one thing he learned from his time in prison was to kill his victims afterward so they could not testify against him in the future. Susan Murphy took the stand to testify against Paleologus. He had apparently targeted her just four days after he was let out on parole. Susan gave a very detailed account of all that happened to her. She explained that she was at Century City Mall, notably the same place Christine was just hours before she went missing. Victor had approached her, 
but he introduced himself as Victor Thomas. Victor then invited Susan to an audition the next day. Susan knew right then and there that something was off about Victor. Later, Susan called the Screen Actor Guild to ask if a new James Bond movie was in production. When they gave her a negative response, Susan knew that Victor had lied. Just like Kathy, Susan decided to meet up with Victor for the audition, hoping she could stop him. She met up with Victor the next day, but did not make the mistake of going alone. She had a mic and a camera on her, and for added security, her boyfriend Tony, who was a second-degree black belt, watched from the car. Victor suggested they get a couple of drinks before the audition, but the building he was pointing to looked nothing like a bar. In fact, Susan described it as an abandoned building. Susan then pointed towards the car where her boyfriend was watching. Seeing this, Victor became uncomfortable and eventually ran away. Susan got in the car with Tony and they chased after him. Unfortunately, Victor eluded them. The police could not go after Victor because a crime was not committed. Unfortunately, does not even begin to cover it because if something had been done, Christine would not have lost her life less than a month later. The Verdict All these accounts helped showcase the clear pattern of Victor Paleologus' actions. By the time it was over, seven women had put their fears aside and come together to testify against him. Although there was a complete lack of evidence, the prosecutor did a good job establishing the pattern of Paleologus' crimes. Paleologus' was methodical. He told the women to buy the same clothes and always use the promise of a career-making audition to lure in his victims. Victor Paleologus is a man who abused the justice system for years. He had to be stopped, but it came at such a great cost, Christine's life. Surprisingly, Victor Paleologus accepted a plea deal. He saw all the circumstantial evidence building up against him and did not want to risk getting the death penalty. But for some reason, he took a 360-degree turn and wrote an 11-page letter to the court asking to withdraw his guilty plea. Finally, on September 15, 2006, Victor Paleologus was sentenced to 25 years to life for the murder of Christine Johnson. However, as the years passed, Paleologus became eligible for parole in 2023, but he chose to waive his right to a hearing for two more years. This decision sparked outrage and led to the creation of a group called Justice for Christine, dedicated to preventing the release of her killer. Despite the efforts of Justice for Christine, many felt that Paleologus' sentence was far too lenient considering the gruesome nature of his crime. It was a mere 25 years behind bars, much less than what some believed he truly deserved. As this story unfolds, it raises questions about justice and punishment, especially when compared to cases like that of billionaire Jeffrey Epstein, whose sex crimes seem to result in little to no significant punishment at all. To unravel this story further, click on this suggested video to watch.